Awesome. And I'll just share a little bit of logistical information um, and then we'll get going with the presentation. So just want to welcome everyone, let you know we are recording this presentation so that we can share it out on our YouTube channel and um, with folks who've RSVP'd. We do have uh, closed captioning options and if you need those, you can enable them at the bottom of your Zoom window by clicking um, the live transcript button and then um, the option to show subtitles. So um, yeah, so thank you for joining us for this learning program about beavers this evening. I'm Mariah Fogg, the Community Conservation Manager for the Berkshire Natural Resources Council. And addition, in addition to our presenter tonight, um, I'm joined by Rich Montone, our Director of Fundraising, and Charlotte Hood, Volunteer and Outreach Coordinator. Um, for those of you who might be unfamiliar, the Berkshire Natural Resources Council is a regional land trust actively working throughout Berkshire County on land conservation, land stewardship, and community engagement. BNRC conserves land to protect water resources and wildlife habitat, also for climate resilience and to connect people to nature through accessibility and engaging activities. Um, and that connection to nature can really take many forms, enjoying trails, bird watching, supporting local farms, um, amongst many other things. And it can really be deepened by learning about and engaging with the land. So we'll do a little bit of that tonight. Um, and I'd like for us just to pause for a moment and really acknowledge the deep connection of the Mohican people to this land, which is their historic homelands. They call themselves the people of the waters that are never still, the Mahekana'uk. And they lived and cared for what we now call the Berkshires and well beyond for thousands of years before Europeans forcibly seized their lands with neither shame nor remorse. Um, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community and uh, these lands continue to be of great significance to the Mohican people with numerous ways to engage, learn, and continue to deepen your connection. Um, and we'll send some follow-up resources um, in, in our email later, uh, probably tomorrow. And uh, we please ask that you give thought to the native land that you're Zooming in from tonight. Um, with that, I'll pass it over to Rich. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm really looking forward to tonight's program. As Mariah said, I'm the Director of Fundraising and Development at BNRC. I see a number of donors in the participant list, which is terrific. Thank you so much for your support because BNRC is donor funded. So all of the land protection, all of the wildlife protection, all of the uh, preservation of farms, the free access to the outdoors, the climate resilience work that BNRC is able to do is all thanks to donors. I'm going to put a donor link in the chat if it's something you'd like to use. But as I said before, I see a lot of donors um, already in the participant list, so thank you for your support. This program and so many other programs that are offered both online and in person at the BNRC Reserves are also free, thanks to donors. So I am looking forward to this program that donors are making possible tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rich. Hi, everyone. Um, please join me in welcoming our guest, Nathan Buckout. Nathan grew up in East Hampton, Massachusetts, and went to college at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado and served in the Air Force for a couple of years before going back to school at UMass Amherst for a master's in wildlife biology. He worked for the National Park Service in the Great Smoky Mountains and Yellowstone, working with bears, elk, feral hogs, and other species. He's also worked for the Forest Service and Alaska Fish and Game on salmon and brown bear projects. He's been with Mass Wildlife now for over nine years as the district wildlife biologist. He lives in Cummington with his wife and two-year-old daughter and their little farm with goats, a donkey named Merrill, chickens, ducks, cats, and dog Winnie. Nathan loves to fish, hunt, camp, garden, and breed. Um, so before I pass it off to Nathan, uh, I'll just say that we have a dedicated Q&A um, session towards the end of the discussion tonight, um, so make sure to keep track of your questions um, related to beavers or um, other wildlife questions that you might have for Nathan um, as they come up along the way. Pass it off to you, Nathan. Thank you very much, Charlotte. That was a great introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and hopefully uh, there's no hitches 
Um, but I would also like to thank BNRC for having me. And, you know, they've been a partnership of Mass Wildlife for a long time, and we've done a lot of good work together. So I want to thank them for allowing me to participate and, and talk and share some stuff about beavers with everybody. Let's see. Is that working? Perfect. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, like they said, my name is Nate Buckout. I'm with Mass Fish and Wildlife. I'm the District Wildlife Biologist for the Western District. That includes all of Berkshire County and then the western parts of Hampshire, Hamden, and Franklin County. We have about 52 towns that I'm responsible for um, with a few other people in my office in Dalton. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, beavers. And I know the title seems kind of stern, but uh, beavers and kind of the laws that go into it because beavers right now are a pretty hot topic issue across the state um, for, for a lot of different reasons. So I'm going to try to shed some light on all of that. So let's see, next slide. Perfect. All right, so again, I'm with the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, or Mass Wildlife. Uh, we were founded in 1866. We're one of the oldest uh, fish and wildlife agencies in the country. And we have a statutory responsibility to protect, restore, and manage the flora and fauna in Massachusetts. So I'm going to do a little history here because it kind of goes into the, the way the beaver, the life history of the beaver um, as the changing landscape in Massachusetts. So pre-settlement, um, she mentioned the Mohican tribe that was out here. So we're talking around that time and before. Um, most of the state was forested. There was you know, not a lot of disturbance to it. There were obviously no big cities, things like that. Um, and there were a lot of beaver around. Um, they hadn't really become a big source of trade yet. Um, but as the colonists started to come over this way, um, they started to form settlements on the eastern seaboard, uh, especially up in the northeast. You know, you have Philadelphia, Plymouth, um, even working up some of the rivers on the Connecticut River. Um, and what this allowed to do is it allowed fur traders to kind of lead the exploration and settlement in Massachusetts. Um, and the fur trade was pretty important, allowing for um, successful foundation of some of these colonies like Plymouth. Um, the pelts were a huge product of New England, kind of the staple product, um, and the fur trade was used to pay off a lot of the colonists' debts when they came to England, or when they when they moved from England to the United, or at that point, the colonies, I guess. Um, this is kind of a, a old picture from around, I think, the late 1700s or early 1700s. Um, they believe that a lot of the animals we have right now and back then were unlimited, um, which led to a lot of over-harvesting. Um, they thought these were inexhaustible resources, so they would trap and trap and trap and trap without allowing any recycling, you know, repopulating, that kind of thing. Um, you know, there were no seasons, no bag limits, there was no restriction whatsoever, and it was a very profitable product. So beavers actually were over-harvested, and as a lot of the colonists started to spread out and they started clearing some of the land and move towards these farming communities, um, and in the mid-1800s was the height, basically, of, of this intensive farming and a a large part, if not most of the state was actually deforested to create these farms. And any one of us who goes out in the woods can see a lot of these old stone walls. You know, these used to be the stone walls that they, when they cleared their fields, they'd pull the rocks out and they'd make these stone walls and they're everywhere kind of lost into the forest at this point. But back then they were all open pasture and open farmland. This kind of habitat is not really good for, for beavers, as well as many of the animals in the United States. Uh, bears, deer, um, just about everything was close to extirpated out of the state. And it was, it was locally extinct. Um, it, there wasn't a lot of variety to this type of landscape. Um, in fact, at one point, I believe over 70% of the landscape was cleared of forest and suitable wildlife habitat. But as time progressed, they started to abandon farms as the Industrial Revolution picked up. You know that Massachusetts has a lot of mill towns on, on Mill River and pretty much every town, too, at this point. What that did was as people abandoned farming, the forest started to return. However, it started off as a monoculture to a point where some of these early trees like pine trees really started to take over. Um, and what happened with that is they became almost like a, a pine farm, pine forest farm. They were cut into materials for boxes, pallets. Um, they made for boot heels, toys, and matches. So, I mean, it was profitable to a time to continue to keep these pine kind of monocultures going. However, uh, things again kept changing. And as the demand for these things went down, 
what happened was some of these longer uh, trees that took longer to, to grow, like oaks and maples and stuff, um, started to spread out and reclaim the land. And you got a lot of these different varieties of habitats. And it's a little bit more focused on what we have today, a, a, a pretty good complex nature of forest here in Massachusetts. And what that did was allow a lot of these animals to start to return. So uh, beaver, we're, we're going to focus on, but there's a similar story for a lot of animals, such as bear, deer, um, turkey, you know, all these animals were gone and they started to come back. So they all parallel what we're, I'm going to talk about with beavers here. Uh, but in 1928, there was a beaver colony that was found in West Stockbridge. Um, after Before that, there really were none. They had slowly made their way back, usually through the, you know, the Adirondacks and that kind of way. Um, and then there was uh, in the 30s, there were a male or two males and a female that were trapped in the Catskill Mountains and they were relocated and released into Lenox Mass. Um, and this were there were all the way from then until about the 1980s, beavers were actually live trapped in other states, usually New York, and relocated to a suitable habitat in Massachusetts to try to reestablish this population. Um, so yeah, so between 1940 and 1980, they were relocated back here. So now we have the current population of beaver in Massachusetts. So what is a beaver? Well, most of us have seen pictures of beaver. Um, you know, maybe we've been lucky enough to see them out in, in when we're walking around wetlands or a pond. Um, but it is the largest native rodent to North America. Um, you can have them up to 100 pounds. I've personally worked with some that have been close to 60 pounds. That's a much larger animal than they can appear, especially when most of the time you only see that little head floating around in the water. Um, but some of the key characteristics uh, is their long paddle-like flat tail. Um, they have four very large ever-growing incisors where um, they need to chew on wood. They need to chop down trees to help wear them down. Um, otherwise, the teeth keep growing just like most rodents. Um, they also have webbed feet, which help them swim. They're very adept at swimming. They do have some unique features that allow them to be uh, to, to swim and to be an aquatic mammal. Um, so they have ear valves that kind of shut when the nose closes the water so they don't get ear or water into their ears. Their nostrils also close. Um, because they spend most of their time in the water, they don't need great eyesight. So they develop kind of poor eyesight. Um, they rely on other things such as their nose or their ears or other senses. Um, and then the safety of the water helps with that. Their tail is a unique thing too. It's used for propelling, um, signaling. If you've ever gotten close to a beaver hut while out, you may have heard a slap on the water or a splash. It's usually a beaver that's very unhappy that you're there and he's trying to basically scare you out or tell you, hey, this is my place. I'm, I'm here, get out. Um, it's also a great storage for fat um, as a resource, especially in the colder months of the winter. And when they're on land, they use it as balance. Uh, sometimes I know it, it, they're very different in size, but people do commonly confuse muskrat and beaver. Um, I get calls about young beavers all the time and they turn out to be muskrats. Um, so it, just a little difference between the two. You know, they're both rodents, but the muskrat has a rat-like tail. Um, it's only two to four pounds, whereas the beaver can be up a, upwards of 60 usually 20 to 40 on the, you know, the middle to lower end. And, you know, beavers build those, you know, iconic wooden lodges, um, you know, with all the, the debris on it, usually out in the middle of a pond, very large. Whereas muskrat, and you, you will see these, but usually they're closer to the shore, have kind of these lodges, usually have a mix of mud and cattails or on this, unfortunately, phragmites, which seems to be more and more common. And they're also only about two feet tall as opposed to a, a six to eight foot tall beaver. That's standing though. Usually they're around four feet, you know, long or tall, depending on the tail. So a little bit more uh, about their life habits. Um, they are generally monogamous. They breed anywhere from February to March. So right now is kind of the, the middle of their breeding, uh, breeding period. Um, they will have two to six kits or little ones that are born in the early summer, late spring. Um, and then unique, uh, something interesting about them, they don't hibernate, they're active all winter, but you don't often see that activity. Um, you know, one, they, they very active, um, at night, you know, crisp, crepuscular or nocturnal, I mean, or in the evenings or mornings crepuscular. Um, but also they live in family groups. So they don't not only just have the two adults and the kids, but they have the young of the year before that. So it's basically like they keep their teenagers in the house for another set of years. And then they have the younger ones. And then when it's time for the second group, they'll disperse, go up or down river, cross wherever to find a new place to build a dam and a lodge themselves. The early kits will move to the middle 
and then they'll have another set. So there's always usually three generations or not, not necessarily generations, but three age groups within a lodge. They are vegetarian. I have had people ask if they eat fish and also turtles. They do not. They are strict vegetarians. Um, they tend to cache their food underwater for winter. You'll often see what looks like a big pile of debris with some branches sticking out not too far away from a, uh, a lodge. What they do is they'll stick it down in the mud and it acts like a refrigerator to keep it nice and good for the, the whole winter. They really get busy during the fall, really stocking that up. What they really prefer to eat are the, the Cambrian layers, that nice, juicy, like right inside layer of bark. Um, they like willow, poplar, birch, maple, beech, but in a pinch, they will eat just about any. Um, they also do eat aquatic vegetation. So you'll see lilies, pond, weeds, sedges, those kind of things. They will eat that as well. And this is kind of just a diagram of what a general beaver setup would be. Um, their dams are very interesting. Uh, if you have the opportunity to look at them, they are built very, very well. Um, they, they're, some of them are, are, are very large, some are deep, some are small. Uh, I believe there's one in Canada that you can see from Google Earth, I guess, space. That's, I think, close to two miles long, which is probably generation after generation building it. Uh, but it is a, a very difficult work but it accomplishes it very quickly because I have had to deal with uh, some of the issues with beavers and I'll talk about that later on, but uh, you can you can destroy, a, a, put a hole in a dam and it'll be completely repaired quicker than you can actually take it down. Um, they're very, very industrious animals, industrious animals. So that's just a picture of what you see. Um, sometimes you'll see multiple lodges in a pond. What that usually is, is one beaver that has changed different lodges. If the body of water is big enough, you can have multiple sets of beavers in it, um, but generally they're pretty territorial. So you normally just get the one dome-shaped lodge and then you know, somewhere there's a dam. So this is what some of the dams look like. Um, I truly believe that beavers hate the sound of running water uh, because no matter where you find running water, they try to dam it up. I, I think it's just one of those things that just really irritates them. Um, so they dam up and that's what they do. They're one of the only animals besides human that will actively change their area and habitat to suit their own needs, which is incredibly impressive. Um, the dams they make are, are basically the way they create their own, or their own home. They'll flood out just about any area that they can that has a source of water filling it. And what this does is it allows them to spread out. It allows them to reach um, more trees, more food on the edges where they don't have to climb on land, they can swim to it, which is a lot safer from them. It protects them from predators. Oftentimes you'll see what look like tunnels or, or uh, trenches up through kind of like the banks. Um, those are just little trenches they dig so they can knock debris or knock, the, knock branches into it. It's much easier to carry it on water than it is to carry it over land, as well as the longer they're in water, the safer they are. So Again, these these thing these dams can be several feet high. Um, some of them are two, three hundred feet in length. Um, and again, they're they're really just used to create their safe area to build their lodge, their food cache in, uh, and basically build their neighborhood. Pretty easy to identify beaver sign. Um, people who have beavers on their property and trees they don't want down really know this very well. Um, a lot of times, it'll be seen by a lot of these either chewed trees or half chewed trees. Part of the reason that these trees are half chewed, especially the bigger ones, is because they do most of the work, but they don't want the tree to fall on them. So they wait for a big storm to blow the tree over. And that way they kind of can keep themselves safe while getting the harder part of their job done. Once the tree's on the ground, they can easily take it apart, especially the branches and move it on their own. Um, in the bottom left there, you'll see a like a muddy mound. Um, what they do is they have these, they'll make these mud mounds with their, their caster glands, their glands that, um, the, the back where their anus is, and it's a very strong land. Um, it's kind of a, hey, this is my neighborhood, saying who's here, or hey, is anybody around, or marking territory. Um, so that's, you, you, you'll often see those. Um, a lot of times you can smell them. It's a very, very strong scent. Um, they'll also deposit urine on it, like a lot of animals, to mark these territories. So beavers, I'm going to talk about some of the benefit, beneficial aspects, and there are a lot of them. Um, some of the basic ones, um, aesthetics, people like seeing beavers, people like taking pictures of beavers, people like learning about beavers, you know, teaching kids, museums, that kind of thing. There's a lot of different, you know, kind of those, in, some of those intrinsic values to it. Um, 
There are economic benefits. Um, those can take the form of some people still do trap beavers. It's, it's a very rare thing in this state now. It doesn't happen much. But also there are other economic benefits like people who like to hike and they see a beaver or they want to get pictures or you know some of this uh, outdoor recreational tourism. Um, any wildlife viewing can be an economic benefit in that situation. They also create wetland habitat, which does a lot, a lot of good things. Uh, it improves the water quality um, by basically acting as a giant filter. It traps large amounts of silt, recharges the groundwater, removes and transforms nutrients, and removes and binds a lot of toxic chemicals. So it's it's a big filter for a natural filter for a lot of Mother Nature. Um, you know, in in these wetlands also they provide a huge, huge benefit in times of uh, drastic weather, which we're seeing a lot more and more of. So you get a lot of storms, especially out West. We're kind of lucky out here in, in the Northeast, but out West in areas like California, where they have these immense droughts and then all of a sudden massive rainwater flooding, what beaver ponds and swamps can do is they can actually absorb when you have these heavy rains, absorb a lot of water to help slow down or even prevent flooding. And then in times of drought, there are areas that usually contain and hold water. So uh, these these really extreme weather events as climate changes, uh, they can really be a successful bastion to protect against some of that, especially people. And, and that can translate into money as well. If you're protecting from these storms and flooding and drought, um, it can it can protect not only people, but a property and those kind of things. It also creates, like I mentioned, wetlands, which is great wildlife habitat. Um, you know, waterfowl, love it, moose, fish, uh, mink, river otter, I mean, it, countless amphibians, snakes, turtles, birds, uh, they, there's just so much life. If you ever get a chance to kayak through any of these beaver swamps, it's it's amazing, especially in the height of summer, the, the life you'll see moving around in the water. Um, and, and another kind of habitat creation is as the water spreads out, and it will kill off trees, you'll see in the upper left picture there, um, and those trees make great standing dead hollow areas for a lot of uh, these cavity nesting birds like wood ducks, but uh, and, and other species. But also, you know, beaver dams don't last forever. Beavers move on, beavers die. And sometimes as the water goes back down or the dam gets busted, all that extra nutrient and stuff that's spread out from the beaver pond has now created some very fertile soils along the edges and allows for new early successional forests to pop up, different types of grasses, which are all very beneficial to a lot of different wildlife, as well as creating a different complex habitat mosaic around these areas. There are negative aspects. Um, again, this is controversial to a lot of people, but um, what I will say is that, you know, one of the big things is uh, that I have to deal with, especially answering phone calls and trying to solve some of these situations is flooding. Um, you know, people's houses, their yards get flooded, septic systems, um, it can flood railroads, train, uh, uh, yeah, railroads, runways, uh, human roads, um, electric facilities, gas utilities, um, hazardous waste, uh, treatment plants, those kind of things. Because a lot of those, unfortunately, are built near water. Um, they historically were. And when beaver flood it, you know, that water can mix with it, can even flood that and actually get it back out into the system, the rivers and streams nearby. Um, so those are some of the big issues, you know, that I deal with as well as Residential, unhappy people um, that have their backyards flooded, um, you know, agricultural land, a lot of crop damage. If, you know, people want to do near water, uh, you know, the whole Connecticut River Valley is a flood zone. Um, they deal with that in a different aspect. But any of these flooded areas that, you know, have beavers, you could have crops flooded, which if you've got the crops there, it could be bad. If it's off season, you could replenish the soil. So there is plus or minus, but it's hard to convince the farmer of that. So when you get these kind of flood events, you can contaminate drinking water supplies um, in public water uh, wells, and you could ruin septic systems. So one of the things people hear about is giardia. Um, on, interestingly enough, so it's an uh, intestinal prozone, um, but beavers are often the ones that people believe, you know, they are associated with giardia. You think, oh, the water's sick because of beaver, you're going to get giardia. But often that's not actually the case. It's incredibly rare that beavers are. Usually it's other species that maybe have defecated or, or died or spread it in whatever to um, the water source. So around streams or ponds or, or any of these things and it gets into that water, whether it leaches in or goes in. So a lot of times they're the scapegoat for it, even though they're not the actual cause. 
So this is a big part of what I do is resolve these conflicts with Beaver. The best one is tolerance, that and education, um, because beavers are here, just like every other animal. They're not going anywhere. So we have to learn to coexist with them. Unfortunately, a lot of the places that I deal with, there weren't beavers in that area when the houses were built. So maybe the swamps had been drained to a point or there were no beaver ponds. So people built houses in areas with swamps. Well, now the beavers are back. We have these drastic rain events and those areas now flood. And it was, it, it's not really a thing that they saw coming into it because there weren't any beavers around. And it's only recently that they've really expanded their range. To protect your trees, a lot of people have some nice, fancy, expensive trees, or they don't want to see a tree get killed or fall on something that they have near their house that they might be near a pond or a stream that a beaver's in. There are easy ways to do it. Wrap it in hardware cloth or wire. Um, you know, you want to make it, like I said, beavers can be four or five feet tall. So you want to get it at least a four foot tall fence part. Um, you want it flush to the ground because they will go low, but don't wrap it too tight because if the tree grows or if you forget about it, it could end up growing into the tree and even killing the tree. I'll talk a little bit more later about water flow devices. Um, this is more of a, a long-term larger solution that usually doesn't happen for people or individual houses, but more of roadways and you know larger scale areas. Trapping beaver is another solution, but it's not... It's not necessarily a solution. It's it's basically putting a Band-Aid on it. Um, it, it and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more about that later. These are just different options for resolving. Um, and then altering or removing a dam. But again, that is not the solution. And there's a lot of other things that go with that. So now I'll get to the, probably might be the boring part. So I'll try to make it interesting. But um, <laughs> Beaver Law. So there's a lot that goes into this. Back in the early 90s to mid 90s, um, there was a ballot referendum um, to ban cruel traps that were aimed to limit the trap styles that were allowed in Massachusetts. Um, and this is a little history is kind of important for where I'm going with it. Um, in that, they also banned bear baiting and statue and the use of dogs, bear for bobcats. There was a whole slew of laws that came in out of it. Um, it passed overwhelmingly in Eastern Mass in the urban states, but it wasn't as supported out in the Western states where they were still dealing with a lot of beaver and other animals that were trapped. So these are some of the prohibited traps. They're not allowed in Massachusetts whatsoever. Um, anything that's a foothold, leg hold, um, snare, uh, colony trap, body gripping traps, kill traps, those are not allowed. Um, the only traps that are allowed in Mass are live traps which there's a couple different kinds. You have box traps, yeah, which are kind of like those look at square, rectangular looking ones. Cage traps, which are also square. You can find them at tractor supply. They're all, or have a heart traps. Um, the beaver traps I use are called Bailey or Hancock. They're about a 40 to 50 pound chunk of metal. Uh, they're very hard to use to, to, to lug into these areas, but they're the only ones that we're allowed to. Looks like a big you know, chain link fence clam suitcase. Um, and that is a live trap as well. And the only kill traps allowed are um, near mouse and rat traps that you buy at like a Home Depot or something. So um, with that referendum back in 1996, um, because trappers couldn't really use traps that, and, and whether you like trapping or not, those kill traps or leg hole traps were very effective um, from a, a you know a, an objective point of view. Um, and now without those, there was trapping took a massive hit. The beaver population wasn't nearly as regulated as, as it had been. And the response was that the beaver population grew. So the red line is trapping, um, you know, and it was pretty consistent up until about that referendum where it, it, there was a spike. And the year or two before, what, what caused the referendum was that trappers asked for more traps to use. They were granted it. And once the rest of the public found out, they put that ballot. So there was a short period of time where trapping drastically increased. The ballot passed, it drastically decreased. And you can see it, it went from, you know, a high point of close to 60,000 um, to, you know, 2,000 beavers, which is a, a drastic decrease. Well, with those beavers not being trapped and spreading even more, um, the yellow shows kind of the population. It just drastically started to rise across the state, recolonize areas that it hadn't been in. And even now there are beavers that are approaching southeastern Mass and heading towards Cape Cod area where they haven't been in probably a couple centuries at this point. So there's a couple different types of trapping. And I am going to go over this because it is an option for people and people should understand that it, this is out there. 
Um, there is a regulated trapping season for beavers from November 1st to April 15th. That is using those big open traps that I was talking to you about. They're all live traps. So if you catch the wrong animal, you can release it. Um, they have to be checked with, within 24 hours every single day. So you can't leave it for a long time. Um, any licensed trapper, you have to go through a course to become a licensed trapper and you have to actually register your traps. So it isn't just something anybody can do, um, but any licensed trapper can trap beavers during that time. Again, using those box traps or Hancock and Bailey traps. Those require special training as well. So this isn't just people going out and throwing things, doing things that they shouldn't. This is a, a, a highly controlled training that people have to get to one, get a trapper's license, and then to get that training certification for a specific trap. So any animals that are trapped without the emergency permit during the regular trapping season must be checked in at a Mass Fish and Wildlife office or online. So we do regulate that. We do make sure that they are all checked in. You have to utilize the pelt um, or the meat. They are, they are required to, to utilize that animal. So we recommend for people who have beaver issues, the best thing to do is taking a beaver during the trapping season. Um, it is the most effective way and it is the generally the, the the easiest way, the cheapest way for people who actually have a problem on their personal property instead of hiring someone. <clears throat> they can be utilized as a renewable natural resource and people do still use them. In fact, a lot of people actually do harvest them to eat um, as well as their pelts can still be sold. Um, we it, it helps eliminate some wanton waste. And what I mean by that is if you have to get an emergency permit, which I'll talk about, a lot of times those can't be eaten or sold. They have to be given, turned over to us or somebody else where they're not really being utilized. But if you trap it during a season, they can be. Also during the fall, winter season, their pelts are at the best peak to be sold if they were to be sold for a flea mar or a fur market, which, you know, again, not everybody agrees with it, but this is just, if you're going to do it, this is the way that we generally recommend you go about it. So there is an emergency permitting process, and I would bet that at least somebody, maybe multiple people who are listening right now have either gone through this or will have to at some point. Um, it is a good thing to know. So when that ballot passed in 96, Mass Wildlife lost the ability basically for a lot of the permitting process. Your local board of health is the one that you go to. So if you have a beaver flooding situation or a beaver problem, you have to go to your town board of health. Um, it, because they'll consider it a threat to human health and safety or determine whether it is. If they determine it's not, then you might be out of luck. But what happens is the, the flooding of roadways, septic systems, wells, those kind of things, those are all emergency situations. And you would go and you would talk to your board of health and they would say, you know what, this is a threat to, you know, human health, human safety, you know, these kind of things. So again, flooding of roadways, power lines, power line right of ways, uh, electric gas lines, things that need to keep, you know, the infrastructure going, septic systems and wells, you know, any homes, hospitals, fire stations, you know, these critical things. Um, so what they need to do is get an emergency permit. So if there is one of these things, they can be issued a 10 day emergency permit by the board of health. And what can happen is they can use that to remove the beaver using a actual trapper, a licensed trapper, if it's during that season from November to April, or they have to hire what's called a problem animal control agent. Those are people that are vetted also by us, have to go through training, have to pass testing, but they'll often deal with a wide variety of things and they can do it out of season. Um, you may be able to get a breach or remove a dam, but that's a lot more difficult and that usually requires a different permit. Um, and another option is to install water flow devices. So you need to go through your conservation commission for the last two. You have to make sure that it's not going to dis destroy or alter any of the wetlands, things like that. Um, and it is a pretty hefty offense if you do it illegally, if you breach that on your own um, or remove any of these dams or even, uh, you know, try to dislodge a beaver lodge, take it apart. So you can hire a pack agent their or a licensed trapper, depending on the time of year, but they must carry their permits at all times. So you need that permit outside of trapping season. If it's during trapping season, you do not need a permit. If you have somebody flooding, a uh, beaver flooding your septic and it's during that season, you don't need to go to Board of Health. If you know a licensed beaver trapper, you can come in and trap it for you. That's the simplest way and the easiest way. Um, so <clears throat> when you there are certain restricted traps, but they're not really used in the state anymore. So I'm not really going to touch on that. But there is no permit needed during the trapping season if you're using a licensed trap. That's That's the cheapest way to go about it. 
for dams, you must get an emergency permit from your board of health. Um, from the Conservation Commission, you also have to have authorization. And again, they'll let you know how it has to be done. They should know all the wetlands regulations. That's what they're in charge of, of doing and, and kind of making sure that you're doing it by the book in the right way. So if they're still there, uh, if you try trapping them and that didn't work and you remove the dam, well, we all know that they're going to build it pretty quickly. I've, I've had to deal with that. Um, they are, you know, getting rid of them is a temporary solution, but they'll come back. They'll repair it. They'll recolonize these areas. And you don't want to damage what the wetland area that's there after all those benefits that we talked about earlier. If the beavers are not still there, then you could do a long-term solution. So say you've still got water that's flooding. You've trapped out the beavers. They haven't come back, but the water's still high. It's still flooding your septic. Um, this is when, you know, you, you could install one of those water flow devices, but that doesn't mean beavers won't move back in. If they were there for a reason, they're going to be back very likely. It's just kind of a cycle that we have to learn to live with. If you breach, it should be done in, in usually late to mid-summer and into fall. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, you know, after the late fall, they're usually building their food cache. Um, it's not as big a deal now. We used to have a big salmon program and they would use them as spawning beds. But a lot of a lot of fish do still spawn that time of year. And by drawing down the water, it could affect them, especially as it gets colder. Certain animals like turtles or whatever that may go under the mud. If you dry out an area that they're actually hibernating under that mud, it could kill them. It, it could damage, you know, the area that they're trying to stay in. Same with frogs and any of those animals that burrow down in the mud. That's why we try to use the trapping, regular trapping for beavers for November and March, because we don't want to expose a lot of those animals that are trying to stay safe and warm during the uh, the freezing temperatures of the winter. Um, and then again, you know, early season, a lot of new babies are born, tadpoles and, um, you know, beaver kits, they, they depend on those ponds. And by reducing that water, you could create a lot of damage to a lot of different species. So water flow devices are interesting. They do work sometimes. Um, again, it's usually a combination of things that really works. But what these are, um, it's basically culvert tubes that you put under through the uh, beaver dam. And then you basically fence below and above it. And what the beaver realizes is he builds a dam. He doesn't understand why the water's still going through it because they don't realize if you offset, they won't be able to block the pipe. And you put fencing around it so they don't stuff the pipe. So the water can continue to flow through without actually taking down the dam. So the beavers don't know what to repair and the water can keep going through. They do require regular maintenance not just from beavers, but also just any drift that comes through, leaves, anything like that can block it up and raise the water level if you block that entrance and outlet as well. So they're not always affected depending on the site either. This is kind of a an idea of how they work, but you have the intake device, which is usually a big piece of culvert or pipe or whatever that's well above the dam, and you put holes in it, the water goes through it, goes under the dam and then it exits and it's it's pretty simple but again stuff can get in there debris can get in there and sometimes the beavers are smart enough to understand that they can block it as well so you you can you know there, there's a whole bunch of different ones i won't get too much into it if people have questions about it or concerns we can talk after about the in intricacies of you know water flow and the, these flow devices so what does that mean for everybody well um, other Massachusetts towns um, have made arrangements for some of their DPW people to get their trapper's education course, their license and a registration number to allow the actual town to handle the situation without having to hire outside people. It is a helpful thing to have. A lot of times the DPW are the people that are going to deal with it. Um, there's a few different courses that are at, um, done across the state that we do. If you want information on those, I can give you those as well. They are free. Um, addressing these issues more effectively and efficiently. And we have a whole bunch of information on our website about that. Again, I'm going to tell you the two most important things to addressing nuisance beavers is tolerance and education. Um, and then working with uh, different people to try to come up with a better solution where the beavers and, and people can coexist. So if you were looking for more information, again, I'm out of Dalton. So that is, you know, my office is, uh, not too far from where BNRC is. And we, these are all the towns, the different places. Um, contact any one of these offices, our field headquarters, and we can give you all the information. Um, also mass.gov slash mass wildlife. We have all kinds of different stuff about living with wildlife, many different species, um, and anything you want, or even ways to get a hold of me or other people. So with that, 
Um, I like to leave a lot of time for questions, and that doesn't have to be about um, beavers. It can be about whatever you want for wildlife. Um, I do a lot of bear work, um, especially this time of year, but it's kind of one of the things that I predominantly do as well as deal with the phone calls that inevitably come with bear work. So if you have any questions, I'd like to open it up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, for questions, uh, folks have a, a number of options. You can input them directly into the Q&A. I think that would be our preference. It's easier to keep track of. Um, if you're having a hard time finding that, it's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. But there's also the chat if you want to input questions into there. And if you'd like to virtually raise your hand, um, Charlotte and I can unmute you and you can ask your question yourself. Um, we did have one question come in a bit early, so I'll just ask it to get us going. Um, let's see here. So Carrie asked, when the babies get to be two years old and they leave uh, the lodge, can they make their new lodges near the parents? So, yes, it, it depends. A lot of times they don't go as far. And with a lot of different species, the females um, don't have to go usually as far as the males. They're tolerated a little bit more. But if it's a big enough body of water, they will be tolerated by their parents to move on down. Um, if it's limited for resources or a smaller stream or even a small pond or swamp, then a lot of times they won't tolerate it um, because they need those resources to continue to, to produce more kits. Um, but it, sometimes, you know, you get a, a big river or a big lake. Um, they will allow multiple lodges on it. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Mm hmm. Okay, um, thanks. I'll ask the next question um, from our chat, which is, will beavers reuse a previously occupied den? Very rarely do they use a previously occupied one. Um, a lot of times, the reason there's a reason why that one is not occupied anymore, um, whether that be it wasn't a sound one, there was flooding, or you know a predator got into it. So a lot of times, you'll see even beavers that have lived in that lodge and abandoned it will build a new one right near it or, or somewhere in that area um, and you'll often see multiple old kind of crumbling lodges in the same area so they they i don't believe they really often use that if at all um lodges that were abandoned and again they were abandoned for a reason so a lot of times they're, they're drawn to a different area awesome rich i see your hand is raised if you want to go ahead and ask your question yeah i just wanted to confirm with nathan for attendees who are not familiar with the picture that you have on the screen right now, I have been to a bear check before. So I just wanted to confirm this is a bear check and uh, mama bear is tranquilized so that you can uh, check on her health and baby bears are in your jacket to um, keep them warm while mama is getting checked out, right? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I, I always like to put that picture or a picture like that because uh, I, I love being able to work with bears. So yes, um, the bears in this picture, that's mama. She's under anesthesia. We have a, a big collaring program where um, I have 11 bears in the Berkshires that have radio or GPS collars on them. And uh, I trap them in the spring, put collars, and then I go and find them in the winter and I crawl into the den um, normally with a, a long pole and drug. And I will jab mama. Um, she'll go under. I'll pull her out. And if she has newborn cubs, we'll pull them out. We'll tuck them in our coats to keep them warm. And I'll look at mama's health. I'll adjust the collar, um, check her ear tags, check everything that's going on, check the cub's health. Then I'll uh, weigh them, weigh her, and I'll get an idea of the sex ratio. And then, you know, we put them all right back under. And then a year later, I'll try to find her again and see how many of those cubs made it to a yearling age. Um, and, you know, basically how successful she is with that. And then, you know, I check her weight again, check the collar. Um, and it's all data we use to determine the ranges and populations of bears in Massachusetts. So yeah, all, all that was, she's just, she's, uh, she's asleep kind of in a, a, a bad dream. It, it's, it's, she doesn't know what's going on and it's a pain reliever. Um, and you know, she's asleep for a couple hours and what'll happen is when we, she goes back in the den, we tuck the cubs right in with her. They go right back into her and they don't even leave. They don't want to go. So yes, that's, uh, that's, they're all live bears there. Um, that's just uh should have explained that I guess earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for clarifying. It was one of the most fascinating things I've done in my time at BNRC is going on one of these checks. Um, so thanks for explaining. Yep, no problem. Okay. Um, an interesting question in the chat. Uh, what is your opinion on the impacts of beaver on Arctic ecosystems? 
if you have an opinion. Yeah, so I'm not super familiar with Arctic systems, uh, you know, what up north, but I would say that a couple things. Um, you know, beavers up there probably haven't been, I mean, they they definitely were part of the fur trade back in the day, but their habitat didn't change too, too much. You know, if you're talking Northern Canada and Alaska and I, you know, even over, you know, in Siberia where they, you know, Northern parts of Europe where they still have, you know, a lot of beavers. Um, I don't think it's, it's changed all that much. Um, I think that's definitely been a part of helping keep the Arctic um, in, in, I won't say it's in good health, but it's part of trying to keep it in good health. Um, I know beaver complexes anywhere are in good health, but um I believe also that might not be as much a, a higher density of beavers up there. I don't believe there would be um, only because as humans have basically diced up the area here, we've created all sorts of little ponds, little swamps, little streams, little areas. And they're like little pockets. Instead of having one lake, we, you know, maybe we put a road through a swamp or a cranberry bog and um, we've allowed more area, basically more different little colony areas. We're up north, you know, they might not have as many, although there's a lot of lakes and streams up there. But I got to imagine it's pretty similar to what it was a couple hundred years ago um, as trapping slowed off. Um, and I got to imagine it's part of what kept the ecosystems up there healthy and wild. Um, you know, you have pretty healthy populations currently of things like moose and deer and wolves and stuff. And beavers are a big part of keeping those populations healthy, one as a food source, but also you know, beaver complexes create great moose habitat and great spots for moose feed. So um, they do definitely have a, a strong impact on other wildlife up there. You have salmon runs that go up that way. I mean, especially on the West Coast and beavers can have a huge impact on creating good spawning habitat for them. So um, the fact that they're, they're there and their, their populations are pretty healthy does have a very positive impact on those Arctic ecosystems. You get a lot of waterfowl, waterfowl that nest up there too. And those beaver complexes create safe places for them to have their nests as well as food sources for them as well. So I would say uh, they, they do have a positive impact there and uh, a big, big impact on the wildlife. Hopefully that answered that. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so we had a question about trapping and why is trapping not used to relocate beavers further up in the watershed away from infrastructure where the ponding can be better utilized to reduce flooding downstream? So in a couple things first, in Massachusetts, uh, it's by law illegal to relocate wildlife, um, you know, for the majority of things. You know, we have relocated bears that have gotten into an area that might be dangerous or, or a moose, but when it comes to the majority of wildlife, it's actually by law illegal to move it or relocate it. Um, and the reason for that, there's a couple, is that if you relocate any animal um, that is becoming a problem or a nuisance to you, the chances are in Massachusetts, you're not going to get it far enough away where it's also going to be near somebody else at that point. But also you could be spreading, if it has any disease, you know, moving an animal that could spread that disease anywhere. And that's a big threat, especially this day and age, where we're seeing a lot more wildlife diseases popping up not just, you know, internationally, but locally as well. And, you know, the other thing too, with moving up further to a, maybe away from in infrastructure, um, if we move that beaver there, there's a good chance he might come right back. And if not, why he was there would just allow another beaver to want to come in that spot. So again, it might be a band-aid on that problem, but it's not the actual solution. Um, you know, and with beavers, most of the area is already colonized. So there's not a lot of places we could take a beaver and put it that already doesn't have a beaver in that occupying that situation if it's good habitat. So it, we, we'd basically be putting in an area where it wouldn't be able to survive or compete with a different beaver. Thank you. Um, a lot of questions coming in. The next is from um, Karen. She says, we have a lot of metal cages around drain pipes in swampy areas in Richmond. Are these all water flow devices to prevent both debris and beavers from filling up the galvanized pipes? Or what is the purpose of the cages, if you know? Yeah, so the, the cages are generally to prevent debris, whether that's from beaver or even just natural flow debris from clogging the pipes. It's much easier to go and clear off the fencing where everything's built up around it and slide it off or move it than it is to get inside a clogged culvert. Um, I have had to do that on some bigger culverts on, on some of our state lands. And I had a beaver that had blocked up one of them and 
it was to the point where the water on the upper side where it was flowing through had completely stopped and it was over the culvert. But yet on the lower end, the culvert was completely open and I could walk in, which is not a comfortable situation when you're trying to pull this stuff out, waiting for the water that's above your head to come through. Um, it's much easier to have these fences around it where at least they'll catch the debris and it's easier to clean them out than actually unclogging a, a, an actual pipe. So it, it has generally for beaver, but also for any debris coming down. Um, it, it's made to protect against that because beavers will go up to the first you know, buffer, which is that fence, and try to block that. And it's easier to create a dam than have them stuff the culvert full of things and then try to get it out of there. Awesome. Got a bunch of questions for you, Nathan. Yep, no problem. <laughs> um, so Mark is curious, is it true that other animals, um, other kinds of animals move into beaver lodges at the same time beavers are there? So it becomes a shared apartment, so to speak. I don't believe we see much of that. Um, it's certainly possible that, you know, something could try to get up in there, but there's very few animals that will, you know, so there aren't a lot of semi-aquatic or aquatic mammals in Massachusetts. You know, you have beavers, you have otters. They won't share the same area. Muskrats usually have their own little huts. Um, you know, I suppose, a, you know, we do have mink, but mink won't because the beavers, you know, they might actually try to go after the beaver kit if they had the opportunity, if it was little. You know, they're not generally a predator of beavers, but they are a predator. Um, I'm sure it's possible some turtles might. Um, you know, you definitely see turtles on the upper side. Um, inside though you know i i doubt that they really do um there's just there's not a lot of animals that you know go under because the, the access is underwater so it have they'd have to go underwater to get in there and the few that we have don't tend to to room up with beavers okay um next question if i can keep track um who are beavers predators so beavers do have a few predators in Massachusetts. Um, besides, you know, like I said, there is a trapping season for beavers. So humans are obviously one of them. Um, bears will rip open the top of a beaver lodge to go after beavers. Um, coyotes and bobcats as well will go after beavers. That's about it in this state. Um, but bobcats are known to try to get beavers, um, especially when they're on land trying to cut down tree or get food. That's why, you know, the the larger the flooded area where they can get the stuff in the water, the safer they are. Um, but I have actually seen a beaver dam that was ripped apart by a bear. You know, they they can smell so well and they'll know the beavers are in there. And that's a big source of fat and, and calories for them that they will rip the roof right off of a beaver dam to get in it. Now, getting them is a different story. You can open that and then the beavers just go into the water and escape. But um, those would be the three big predators would be bobcat and coyote and bear. And it's generally an opportunistic one. Um, honestly, another thing that it's not predation, but kills beavers besides, you know, predators, um, you do see beavers occasionally hit on roads because they're not that fast on the land. And, uh, they do cross, you know, where you have those culverts and they want to get from one side to the other, they get hit. And, uh, interestingly enough, falling trees is, uh, a source of death for beavers when they don't chop it right. And it falls on them. Um, it, it does happen. Um, uh, not a lot, but more than I think people think. A dangerous business. I've heard similarly with porcupines, a lot of fatalities come from them falling yeah, out of trees, not yeah, they not fall out of trees, on unfortunately. It's too bad. Um, all right. So another question for you. Um, do you have any idea what impact introduced Phragmites is having on wildlife? Um, this person said, as it seems to me anecdotally, that otter populations have dropped in a few areas that they're familiar with, where Phragmites is becoming more prevalent um, based on the prevalence of winter tracks of what this person has observed. Yeah, so I don't have numbers on populations dropping or what with Phragmites, but what we're, we're still working on figuring this, figuring out the true impact of Phragmites. That being said, uh, I would definitely say that it is having a, a negative impact. It chokes out swamps where, um, for, for a couple of different reasons. So it does choke out these swamps. I mean, you, you see, it, you can almost walk across it where in the past you'd have cattails and then more wet area, which, you know, it, it might be decent cover for some animals, but one, it doesn't provide some of the food sources that a lot of animals like. It doesn't provide the best cover for other animals. And it can take over the wet areas of a swamp. Um, whereas, you know, cattails on the edges still allow for some of these deeper water parts, which are better for turtles, frogs, waterfowl, 
and then any of the the mammals or, or whatever that are moving through there um and they are taking over um it, it is it is a bad thing and you do see it uh, a lot of animals will utilize cattails for not just food but for you know birds will use them to stuff nests and nesting box areas and you know it's 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 just a bad monoculture to have and it is definitely a detriment to wildlife um we, we're still figuring out the impacts of it and in areas that it's taken over swamps i would i would say that the population of you know in a, in a single swamp you know you might have one one set of otters or one population of otters but they would probably move on once that gets choked out because they they're actually predators so they rely on things like you know shell crustaceans fish um stuff like that and if you have a swamp that gets taken over by that you're not going to have you know crustaceans fish frogs things like that in there they just there's no room for them so they will have to move to a different area uh they would do the same thing with beavers because it would outproduce all the the stuff that they eat um, and it would take up a lot of the area for the water, and it's it's it is detrimental to a lot of those animals. It's also difficult to move through. I know animals move better than people, but it's not fun to walk through. Okay, thank you. Um, Tim has a question about the process of installing a water flow device. Um, would you first trap beavers in the area, then breach the dam to drop water level? in order to properly install the device? Or would you just install the device with Beaver still present? So it depends on how you feel about it. Um, the best thing might be to do both is to trap and install. Um, if it's just a, a quick, a new problem, pretty new, like this is the first time you've had beavers there or whatever, trapping would be the quickest, efficient solution, although it's generally temporary. Um, there is one, there's a company and it's pretty much the only company around um, called Beaver Solutions out of Southampton, Mass. And when I say around, I mean, nationally, like one of the only companies that does this. Um, and, you know, we have worked with them and a lot of times they will set traps while putting in a beaver deceiver, defeater um, to keep the water, to get the water flow going. If you really are concerned about the beavers, um, you, you can, instead of, you know, trying to trap and unfortunately you'd have to euthanize them. Um, you could try putting in a beaver deceiver. Again, it's a little bit more of a complicated process and it's, it can be expensive. It's It requires some special work and special permitting. So that's usually the problem is people don't necessarily want to go through the permitting, take the time to do it or spend the money on it, whereas trapping could be quicker and easier. So it depends on honestly how you want to go about it. Most successfully is probably setting traps while putting it in. You could temporarily alleviate the situation by removing the beavers as well as letting the water continue to flow. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, so a couple more questions for you. Um, this person says they're from Troy, New Hampshire, and they have a small farm pond and had a beaver in 2010. We staycationed there in a tent and listened to the beaver all night munch on twigs, and then it started taking down trees fast to make a dam. I think my neighbor on the other side of the pond relocated him or her. She was so beautiful to watch. We were amazed with her talents. Such an education. Sorry, I didn't completely read that. Not a question there, but a really great <laughs> sentiment, and um, thank you so much for sharing that, Gail. Um, I'll move on to another question. Um, are we good? Are we at a good density of beavers in this state, or do we aspire to a higher density? Um, I'd say we're probably pretty close, at least, especially in the area like the Berkshires. We're probably pretty close to maximum capacity. Um, you know, so a way to judge that or to to look at that is they're spreading east, which means there's enough of the population to colonize and stay here, as well as continue to actually go to new areas or recolonize areas they were in historically. Um, moving, you know, as north and east, um, you know, up to northern, northeastern mass and southeastern mass in that way. So um, those areas are definitely not maxed out. In fact, they pretty much at the beginning of their their stage. So they actually could support a lot more beavers. Um, if you've been down to the southeastern part of the state, there's surprisingly large numbers of bodies of water, cranberry bogs and, and agricultural areas that would be in swamps too, a lot of swamps. That would be great beaver habitat. So that area is is probably hasn't really been the surface hasn't even been scratched yet for beavers. Um, but out here, there's a pretty good chance that it's at what we would call carrying capacity or max carrying capacity, at least biologically. Um, some might argue that um, if you want to look at it socially or 
whatever, uh, you know, people wise, we might be over that because it's a matter of how many beavers people can tolerate, whether that's flooding roads or flooding farm fields. Sometimes that number is lower than the amount of beavers that can actually biologically be on an area. Um, a good way to look at it is deer. So maybe in some areas it could support a lot more deer, but there's a lot of car accidents and a lot of crop damage and people can't support, you know, societally or socially can't support more deer, even though the landscape could. So that I, I'd say that half the state might be where they are and half the state is just starting to feel out what experience what beavers are. Okay, um, so the next question has to do with bears and their population. Is it increasing and um, do we try and regulate it? Uh, so <laughs> yes to both. Um, the mass bear population, out, again, it's very similar to what I just said with the beavers. Out here, we're probably at a pretty close to max, max carrying level. Um, they've been in this part of the state the longest, which they've had time to establish most establish themselves in most areas. Now, if you watch the news, you'll see further and further east. In fact, the multiple times now is bear, a bear has made it onto Cape Cod. And they just had a bear den in Plymouth, Mass. this year. So these are brand new things that have not happened in 300 years. So out that way, the eastern part of the state's in for a rude awakening because the bears are coming. And they will start to colonize and, and re, you know, reestablish themselves in those areas. Um, but here it's we're we're pretty full up and we do it's a difficult thing to regulate um you know they'll eat anything and we found out that so bears will colonize just or establish themselves in just about any area and what we found is there can be higher densities of air, of bears in areas where there are more people which might sound counterintuitive but when you have a bear that's say in the mountains resources for it to to feed are a lot more spread out but you put it in a neighborhood or in a suburban area with some blocks of woods and houses that have garbage and bird feeders and dog food and chicken coops. Well, the bear doesn't have to go very far to fill a lot of its caloric needs. So we're finding that these suburban areas have higher densities of bears that they can handle more bears in a smaller area. Um, and that's what part of this collaring program is doing. I have a lot of female bears and it's amazing to see how they'll overlap each other and, and their, their areas they'll sit in aren't that big, but they will be in and out of you know, the center of Lenox or the center of Lee or downtown Pittsfield. And it's, they will go in and out of these places. So it's, um, it, it, it's, it's a very interesting situation, you know, and, and that number can, can increase a little bit depending on human, but we've, we've created what I like to call an anthropogenic habitat. So, you know, you have woodland habitats or, or mountainous habitat, you know, different habitats, but what humans have done is they've created a habitat and people might argue that, well, we've moved into the bare spaces. You can look at it that way, but before there were, we bears were wiped out of the state back, you know, 300, 400 years ago, before the state was heavily populated. They didn't come back really until the early 19 to mid 1900s when the state was pretty heavily populated. So they didn't come back and we moved back onto their property. They came back and actually found that what we had, what we had created as human neighborhoods and habitat pretty good they got food here they got cover they got sheds to den under and they've actually came into those places on purpose and established themselves there um you know it's not good it creates a lot of human and bear conflict which is a large part of what i deal with but the bears seem to really like the uh the human affected areas or the anthrop anthropogenic food areas um that's why i'll put my pitch, pitch in here to um do not you know don't feed birds and don't feed wildlife i know a lot of people like to but uh They've been feeding themselves for thousands of years without our interference. They don't need us, and it can only create more problems. We're dealing with a lot of different new wildlife diseases, things like avian influenza popped up in bird populations. And when you feed birds, a lot of them congregate together, and that's just how those diseases spread, and it can bring in a lot of other animals. I, I've seen deer and bear eating bird feeders. I've seen coyotes coming in for the seed and the, the rodents that come in with it. You can attract all sorts of attention that shouldn't be there and can create a dangerous situation. That's my little plug for don't don't feed the wildlife. But for the bears, they're here. And the best thing we can do is learn to coexist with them. And the eastern part of the state's going to find that out very quickly. Thanks so much for switching gears and um diving into bears. No problem. <laughs> 
I think we've got one more question and I'll just invite participants. If you have more questions, feel free to plug in. We've got a little bit more time. Um, but this person says, it seems that farms can do more removal or destruction of beaver dams than others can. Can you please comment? And um, they made a note that they're in Amherst. Mm -hmm. So farming regulations are, are an interesting one because there's a lot of exemptions for farms that include a lot of wetland stuff and, and other types of things. Um, as far as I know, it's still they still technically need to get a permit to, to remove any of that stuff. Um, you know, if it's a if it's a man-made farm pond and stuff like that, you know, it's a little different. But um, it's still even even if it's a wetland, they're still supposed to go through a conservation commission for some of the dam removal and destruction. But it a lot of times that that doesn't happen on farms, especially with an immediate need to protect crops if it starts flooding, because a lot of times it'll happen quickly. You know, but uh, I believe you're supposed to go through your your board of health and your conservation commission. If you're going to destroy it with a dam, you have to go through the conservation commission too, um, because you don't know what else it could affect. Um, especially with dam removal, you know, with beavers, it's not likely as likely, but uh, there was a beaver dam that blew out in Belchertown two or three, maybe last year or two years ago. Um, and it was just a natural beaver dam and it blew out and it destroyed a bunch of property below it because it was a pretty big dam. So by, you know, redu reducing that water, even removing the dam, you don't know what you could affect, um, not just wildlife wise, but human wise, if, if it could have an impact on somebody below you with a, se a septic system or, or a basement there that could get flooded. So you really do need to go through the permitting process. That doesn't mean they're going to. All right. Um, another question, which one came in first, um, from Rich. Um, you addressed you addressed pelts and meat as beaver harvest products. Can you mention some of the surprisingly common uses of castorium? Yes. Yeah, so um, I guess I didn't really mention that, but um, the the beaver caster, the castorium. Um, is actually used in a lot of uh, of product like um, make, uh, makeup, um, you know, colognes, um, perfumes. Um, it's used a lot in those different types of things. Um, it is also used by trappers as a lure. Um, I actually use that to trap bears. Um, so it kind of goes along with the bears being a predator. I will use a, a beaver quill lure um, to put at my traps that will draw the bears in from that beaver smell. So they can be reused as that, but it is re, uh, used commercially a lot in, um, I believe it's um, colognes and uh, anything scented like that. So, uh, you know, perfume, um, it might even be in, you know, like makeups, things like that. Um, it's a, a very useful product that is used in a lot of different things that people don't realize. And it's, uh, if you've smelled it raw, it is rough. It is a, uh, it's a, it'll take your breath away, the smell of it. Thank you for that. A few more questions coming in for you. Um, are there projections for when bears will become settled into the eastern part of the state? They are seen as you they are seen as you described, but aren't yet common. Um, when will they become common? So that's that's a difficult one to answer. Um, some are actually established. It depends on how far you consider eastern mass or where that point is. Some are definitely settled in that area already. Um, there's few. The far east to the coast, there might be one or two that have settled in now. Um, the issue with that is, you know, it's a little bit busier out there. So they they can, there's a lot more threats to them, not just humans, but cars and, and things like that. Um, but right now is is the call is the establishing period. They are currently moving there as we speak. And each year we see more and more further and further east. And that will start translating further and further south. This year, I think we had the most sightings um, in the southeast than we've ever had. Last year was the second most and so on. It just, it's increasing every year as they spread further and further. And, you know, some of those long shot ones, they're, they're outliers where they go all the way to the end. But while those make the news, ones that move maybe a couple miles east or, you know, 10 miles east and establish a territory, those are the ones that are moving east at a slow but steady pace as they establish higher numbers in these areas, which allow them to move the next step east, establish themselves, have lots of cubs, push that next instead of one 
outlier. And a lot of those outliers are males that are young males, especially looking for a mate, but going the wrong way. Um, you know, they, they spread out, they travel large distances as a young male trying to establish their own habitat. And those are the ones you usually see that go the furthest. Um, I had a male that a young male that was harvested in uh, not central New York, but you know, Eastern central New York um, that I tagged in uh, Pittsfield, you know, it had probably gone 70, 80 miles. Um, you know, they, they can travel large distances what really we consider establishing is, is breeding populations of females. And they are very slowly, but very surely making their way. Um, every year you're gonna find new towns that, that have it. The other issue with that is that, um, you know, it's, it's getting people to live with them. You know, they see a bear and they want us to come relocate that bear. Some of it is for, you know, we don't want the bear to get hurt. We don't want the bear to, you know, you know we like the bear, please save the bear. And some of it is, we don't want the bear, it's gonna cause damage, we wanna get rid of the bear. Um, for different reasons, they want that bear relocated, but that's just not realistic as the, as they move that way. We can't start relocating bears. It's going to have to be, you have to learn to live with it. And that's why we're trying to do, you know, uh, these information things about bears and, and, and educating people, because that's the only way it's going to work, because it's going to happen. Okay, keep going. Um... Do you, do we know how the beavers know to make the tree fall in the direction of the water when they cut them down? So I don't think we have like a, like a, a know why they just seem to know. Um, it's just what they do is they try to fell it in the direction of the water usually to get as much of that tree into the water. Cause then they can safely break it down. They cut the branches and, and do what they need to in the, where, where there's no predators. You know, if anybody's cut down a tree, you know, you always try to go, you know, the way you want it to go and you always try to get it to go that way. It doesn't always happen. You'll see the same thing with beavers, but they're pretty good at at least aiming it in the direction and, and hopefully something like the wind will take it to the right place. It's just one of those things that they're, they innately know, like some birds know when to fly north or south or turtles know where to go and nest, you know, having been born on a beach and just somehow know. Um, it's just, they know where the water is. They know which way it's got to go and generation after generation has taught them this is how you want to do it and uh, it's it's very impressive they're an impressive animal at what they can do if you've especially seen some of the trees they've taken down it's impressive they're huge all right a couple more for you um so jane was wondering in a situation where a beaver has dammed and is flooding roadways and driveways are the solution are there solutions that can be deployed other than trapping and notching that would enable coexistence so there there are things you can try i mean i'm not sure what would be guaranteed to work but um one of the things we've actually tried with in an area with some beaver issues is basically removing the food source so we have mechanically cut like chainsaws and hand saws the willows and all of the stuff that they like to eat a ways away around the area in hopes that by getting rid of their food source they're like well this this isn't good i need to go somewhere else there's no food here um so making it less enticing if you've got trees that you can wrap that they want even saplings or smaller fencing them off those things could deter a beaver from getting to a food source which could make it different um you know human activity in an area could definitely cause the beaver to not want to stay there because they might not feel safe. So if it's a hiking area or walking, you keep going around there, they might not want to stay there. Um, with roads, you know, you can work with the DPW. Right now, there's a lot of money coming out for climate resiliency. Um, you know, we have these, these high flooding events, high water events, where some towns are putting in bigger culverts that allow more water to go through. Um, and that definitely can help with any situation, including a beaver flooding situation, so the water doesn't go over the roads. We recommend if you're going to build a house, don't build it in a swamp or a low area um, with your driveway. Again, if you can get some sort of area where the water can flow under, um, and then if you see the beavers, try to deter them from wanting to be there. Otherwise, there's there's not a whole lot you can do. You know, it's just better water flow and then getting the beavers out of there, whether that's making it an area that's just not um, habitable for them, whether that's taking away the trees, the food sources. And then, you know, if you got a dog and walk the dog on the shoreline and it messes the area and the beavers know it's there, they might be deterred because of predators. Um, these things can drive some animals out, but it's it's just a situation where it gets really tough. You know, if you can, if you can build your driveway higher, 
and then some culvert underneath it so water can go flow through. That's a good way of doing it. Um, but there's no real great solution. And a lot of them, it really depends situation to situation on, you know, how bad is the flooding? How big is the area? How big is your driveway? You know, all those variables can come into play on how to handle that situation. But if you are dealing with a situation, you know, give us a call and we can we can work with you or see what we can figure out. Okay, it looks like we have just two more for now. Um, is there a general rule for handling flooding in hiking areas? Um, for example, Pleasant Valley, Bear Town, State Park, and others have had quite a few trails negatively impacted by flooding. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Pleasant Valley's Audubon, Bear Town State Park uh, is DCR. And I'm pretty sure that their policy is similar to ours, where that's just going to stay that way. Um, I doubt, especially in an area, like if it's not a health a threat to health and human safety um, or, or infrastructure, they're not going to do anything with it. I, I would honestly believe that, like, especially Audubon, they're going to leave it. Maybe they try to redirect the trail or build a boardwalk over it, something like that. Those are really the only ways because most of these places and in, in our agency included, we don't have a lot of trails on our wildlife management areas, but uh, we really try to leave things be um, unless it negatively impacts, you know, people. But uh, with trails and stuff, I, I don't believe they would do very much for that. Um, and I, I, as far as I know, they haven't. That's why there are a fair amount of trails that can be negatively impacted by this. Um, you know, you can mention it to them, but the, the best way to do that is if that swamp is there, reroute the trail around it if you can. And then you get a nice walk around a swamp, a beaver complex. Um, some places can put in a little boardwalk or, 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 you know, logs to walk across if it's smaller. Um, but those are probably the better solutions. And those are probably the ones that those agencies would go through. There we go. Um, so this is our last question that we have right now. Um, across the country, roughly how many beavers are harvested for industry use, if you have that information? I, I don't. Um, I'm not sure across the country. I know in Massachusetts, I, I don't know a number, but it is very, very low. If it's Honestly, the majority of beavers probably trapped in this state are through problem animal control agents for a nuisance situation and not actual trapped for you know, a resource for fur. Um, the fur industry itself is is going way down. And that's not just a state that's across the country um, with other materials and the demand for fur. Um, a lot of the furs in this country get exported to places like China and Russia. And even then those numbers are, are going down drastically. So trapping as a whole is something that has seen a, a, a steep decline across the country. Um, there just aren't a lot of people getting into it. And then there's not a lot of of a lot of ways to to you know sell the furs really. Um, I know some people do trap beavers for the meat. There are people that specifically like the meat, um, so that's a whole different set. And that is, I would say, a, a an incredibly small number. You know, a, basically a negligible amount of, of of beavers for that. It's not a big thing. Um, it's more of a niche type meat. Um, but with the furs, you know, in this this state especially, it's 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 very 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 limited, um, and the majority of them are are very likely uh, problem animal control and nuisance situations, and not necessarily trapping for furs. Gotcha. Thanks so much. I don't see any other questions coming in at this time. Um... Yeah, definitely flag me if I miss something, Charlotte, but um, just wanted to, you know, begin to wrap up and just say thank you, Nathan, for an incredibly informative and engaging presentation. Your passion for beavers and wildlife um, is vast and contagious. I'm sure folks are going to be singing your praises in the chat um, if it's not happening already. Um, and I did want to just share, I know you mentioned Mass Wildlife's website. Um, I just want to put another plug in for it because I go there often for preparing for our educational programs. There's tons of resources um, and information about Mass Wildlife events as well. Um, so we'll send a link around just to, to share that information. Um, you also have a monthly newsletter, e-newsletter that goes yep. out that I love to receive as well. Um, and there's a quarterly magazine that Mass Wildlife offers that is incredible, great um, photos of wildlife and um, different ways to engage and just learn about the work that's being done. And I think that's just a $6 a year fee, um, very minimal mm -hmm. fee um, to get it that. 
it's cheap. It's it's six bucks. You can sign up online or uh, at a location, and it's a beautiful magazine. It's it's a it it's really got is. really great articles, and it touches on what we do, but not just us. Some of the outside work that's being done, and it's just a really really nice nice look at wildlife and and a lot of stuff that's going on in the state. Yeah. Um, and I also wanted to just put a plug in. Uh, so for young beaver enthusiasts, or if you're looking for a gift for a young person, um, the local Mass Audubon director, Be Becky cushing just wrote a book about, um, it's called What Goes On Inside a Beaver Pond. Really great book. So just wanted to share that. We can share it in the follow-up email as well. Um, yeah, and BNRC appreciates the habitat that beaver create and this opportunity to share the information in partnership with Mass Wildlife. So thanks again, and thank you to all of our participants, whether watching this live or the recording. Um, it really just comes full circle with all this enthusiasm and uh, just thirst for knowledge about the natural world. Um, yeah, and we'll send along the recording uh, tomorrow with some resources. So hope to see you all on a hike or another way soon. And I just want to, if, if I can, one more thing. Please, um, yeah. One, I really appreciate you having me and letting me talk and um, me, being able to share this. Um, I'm very lucky to love what I get to do. And, um, you know, beavers are one of those animals that are very polarizing in this day and age. Um, not everybody knows that, but from my position, I, I do get a lot of, the majority of issues I, with their calls for beavers are negative. Um, and there's a lot of people that don't like them. And they're one of those animals that are just, I, I think they're truly misunderstood and, and underappreciated. And if you ever have a chance or have done it and walked a beaver swamp or a beaver pond, it's truly an amazing place. I mean, the wildlife that is in there is incredible. And if you can get out on a kayak and in summer, it, it, you're going to be blown away with everything that goes on in there. It's it's just amazing. Nathan, do you have a favorite spot that you like to observe beaver? Um, you know, it depends. So, I mean, I, I like, so in general, I like swamps, you know, ponds can have beavers, but swamps, you tend to have a little bit more focus that is smaller. So there's a better chance of running into a beaver. And also with swamps, you have things like turtles and frogs that are just everywhere. Um, there's a couple really nice swamps on mass wildlife areas. Um, we have one on, uh, it's in Chesterfield, it's Fisk Meadows, that has a massive beaver pond complex. It's a whole forest of standing dead trees in a swamp that they created. There's a beautiful heron rookery that happens. So another neat thing with these beaver ponds is the heron rookeries that you see. One that's pretty easily accessible is uh, Skase Pond. Um, it's Mass Audubon. It's right on, I believe it's uh, Barker Road or Swamp Road, um, right in the Pittsfield Richmond line by the airport. Um, there's a little pull off there. It's a big beaver swamp, swamp and uh, there's a big heron rookery there. And it's a beautiful photography spot if you really want to get some neat wildlife shots. Um, that's a really good one close to the area. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, I'll put a plug in BNRC's Bob's Way Reserve gets you up close and personal to a beaver dam that's um, growing every year. And um, the Mass Audubon All Persons Trail, I think, was mentioned by one of our um, uh, in a question, but uh, does it's a, an accessible trail that brings you really close to a beaver pond. So. All right. I'm sure everyone has their own secrets too or favorite places, but um, yeah, really great to, to have you and to share this information and hopefully we'll see you around soon. Hope to be around. And uh, <laughs> any questions, feel free to ask. Call, give us a call. Thank you. All right. Thank see you everyone. Much. Have a good night. Thanks everyone.